Okay. So uh, I, I am uh, I'm uh, I'm the warm up act for Gary Churchill, uh, and I and I hope I'll do justice. Um, uh, unfortunately, my talk will be depressing, um, but uh, let, let's see how we do right after lunch. All right. So behold, the human being um, as viewed classically. Uh, I understand uh, that uh, this is one view. However. Um, oh, I should tell you, I, I work at the Center for Human Disease Modeling, and I'm also um, the Chief Scientific Officer of a, 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 of a biotech company, Resinda Therapeutics. Um, so there's my disclosures. So the human being, uh, but uh, according to sort of the post-genome view, I think this is a more accurate uh, representation of the human being, um, because uh, as we do more biology, more physiology, and more genetics, we begin to appreciate uh, the inherent complexity. So um, for, for those of you who uh, had to suffer through my talk in Toronto, uh, uh, the first portion will be the same, uh, but I do have some new data to share, and I think it's important in the context of what we're trying to do. So today, I just want to focus on the theme um, that has been permeating the meeting, and I think I have the sense it will, be, it will be part of the conversation about what comp 3, 4, 5, 10, and 20 will be, which is moving from the function of genes, which remains critically important, and it was in large part the focus on making this systematic gene knockout, to move to the function of alleles. And I sat through the morning, and I learned a lot, and I really appreciate everybody's talks, but I'm here to tell you that it's a really, really bad idea to just bet everything on introducing single base pair substitutions in another model organism and interpreting the data accurately. And the reason for this is something that I did not discover. Uh, this has been known for the best part of 70 years, but we now have more evidence to bolster this. And this is the notion that the effect of variation is, is species specific. And I really appreciated uh, uh, the slide that Brandon showed on the RNA-seq data. Um, because even misplicing, non-associated splicing, non sense mediated decay, uh, and, and all the exon skipping stuff, even that is specific to species. On another day, I can give you this big treatise, actually, how making CRISPR single base pair knockouts in zebrafish embryos is a truly terrible idea, because this particular model organism has developed a transcriptional um, compensatory mechanism that essentially shields the model organism from, de from early developmental defects. This is now shown. But enough of this, let me show you the data. All right, so this is um, a, a very old study, um, and this is a, a gene in my favorite group of disorders, the ciliopithus, RP group 1L. The allele is arginine 937 leucine. Now, RP group, uh, I, and, and this is from the paper we published back then, and uh, the, the reviewer said, um, well, this leucine cannot possibly be pathogenic because I see here two species that actually encode leucine as the wild type allele. Now remember, we're not in the gene. The, the, the gene has already been shown to be pathogenic. We, we have met the burden of evidence, the burden of proof. So here's the question. But the in vivo complementation study that was done in vivo was suggesting that this allele was loss of function. And just to uh, highlight, uh, for, for those of you who are familiar with this kind of evidence, please bear with me. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Um, this is uh, the spread of phenotype. This is convergent extension. This is uh, uh, a wind phenotype that is a uh, well-known property of, of ciliopathies. Um, this is a suppression, and this is the, the, the distribution of phenotypes. And then this is um, suppression um, a morpholino plus wild type human mRNA. Human, 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 human. Can I say human six more times? Okay. Um, human mRNA, we have almost complete rescue, and then we introduce a single base pair substitution. So the null hypothesis is that when we introduce a single base pair substitution that is benign, there will be no difference between injection of wild type and mutant RNA. This hypothesis is soundly defeated. There's many zeros to this p-value. And in fact, this guy here is statistically in, um, uh, indistinguishable from this guy. And the interpretation is that that variant is a loss of function allele. I cannot tell you if it's a complete loss of function or a 95% loss of function, but loss of function. So we know that null for RP grip one l is incompatible with life in human or in the mouse, for that matter. And yet, we have two species that are homozygous for what the functional test tells us is a, a pathogenic variant. And the question is, why, 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 why? All right. 
So uh, one of you reminded me that I, I've dubbed this Tarzan genetics because it is, uh, and it's sort of this sort of random thing. We go around here, we, 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 we jump around data sets and we try to make conclusions. Um, but the bottom line is we actually try to do a more systematic study of this. So um, I got together with Shamil Suneev and, and, and he educated me on, on how we can do some of these things. And this is the experiment that we did back in 2014. So in 2014, um, uh, what uh, Daniel Jordan did, uh, uh, Shamil's student, is he took two, you know, dirty-ish databases. Uh, HumeVar is dirtier than CleanVar, right? Uh, both are getting better, but both of them are imperfect. And he took these two databases, and he took all missing variants, and he did an alignment against the sequence of 100 vertebrates. We stayed on the vertebrates because once you move to invertebrates, evolutionary distances uh, make uh, 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 correct alignment sometimes quite problematic, and we were concerned about false positive, false negative rates. And depending what assumptions that you make about these alignments, and I'm happy to talk to you about the assumptions and the tolerance, at worst, the most stringent thing is that 3%, 3% of all pathogenic missense variants found in humans are fixed in another species. Um, and the largest estimate is 12%, the most permissive estimate. In reality, the observation that we tend to be playing with is somewhere in the 5 to 7% range. So my statement that I made in Toronto, and I will repeat here because I think it's an important statement, is that all the missense mutations that we know, 7% of them are fixed in another species. I think moving forward, this is a heavily biased data set because when individuals look at uh, research or clinical exomes and they find a candid variant that is homozygous in the mouse or in the cat or in the opossum or something else, they are more likely to discard it and computational algorithms are certainly more likely to consider this allele as, as benign. And that is oftentimes correct, but not always. Okay, so why is this? There is such a thing, something called compensatory deviation. And this is very old stuff. The, um, the, the bacteriologists and microbiologists would shoot me if I claimed any novelty here because we've known this for a very long time. But, you know, again, perhaps we need to remember some of the literature because there was actually literature from the 50s before the Internet. Imagine that. Um, so the, 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 the basic idea was that if you have a pathogenic allele here that is doing something horrible, say, to the half-life of your protein or the, or the folding of your protein, you could have a, a second allele that repairs that defect. So this is a highly deleterious variant, but this plus that makes it a benign variant. Okay, so how do you discover these things? Well, it's actually pretty easy. Here's our, here's our protein, this actual data. And there's a there's asparagine to alanine here, mutated in human disease. And the question that we have here is, wh why is that these four species can tolerate the alanine? Of course, the effect could be in trans, could be in some other gene, could be regular. There's many, many things. But our narrower hypothesis, I guess, you know, Occam would be proud, is that there's some other variant in the same sequence, in the same haplotype, that is somehow shielding the effect of the allele. So the experiment that we did is very simple, um, and yeah, there was no Illumina instrument anywhere to be found, which is just take the sequence, align it, and then look at the other alleles that seem to be traveling uniquely with a candid pathogenic variant, but are absent from the human sequence. If these variants have the capacity to shield the detrimental effect of this allele, then if we were to have a human mutant alanine here, and that has, say, the glutamine or the valine or the lysine, then that should convert the message from mutant to wild type. Yes? Um, and this is exactly what happened. So I'm showing you this is an example of BBS4. This is RPG group 1L the one that I showed you earlier. Uh, so the, here is our R to L, and it turns out, I, I'm sorry, the, I'm not sure how well the, these uh, colors are projecting at the far end, but it turns out uh, in RP grip on L, we identified 33 candidate uh, changes. It's, it's not a small protein. So we identified 33 candidate changes that evolution said they might travel and protect against the pathogenic allele. It turns out a couple of them were actually protecting very well. In fact, uh, in fact, three of them were converting the mutant to wild type. Why is this important? Here's a little girl um, that we saw at Duke back in 2012, um, and she's the one of these fabled uh, 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 diagnostic odyssey kiddos that we all working so hard. Um, and I must say I have an enormous admiration for my colleagues who do this. Um, we all work so hard to overcome. 
So this kiddo, uh, whole exome sequencing trio based, like everybody else does, um, she had the essentially these days almost obligatory mutation in Titan, right? The, those of you in the game, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and she also had two de novo variants, one of them in BTG2 and the other one is NOS2. We have some ideas about NOS2. We, we, we functionalize both alleles in zebrafish embryos and our index phenotype was microcephaly. Um, and to cut a long story short, um, it turns out that microcephaly was uh, likely caused by suppression of BTG2. Um, the experiment, has, as you know before, suppression, we, we've since also made a, CRISPR, a deletion CRISPR mutant and that reproduced. Uh, suppression, rescue, and then rescue with this uh, valine 141 methionine, and that allele was acting as a loss of function. So from that point of view, we had uh, conflicting data. The prediction was that the allele was benign. Exact and Nomad was telling us that this gene is intolerant to haploinsufficiency, um, and the zebrafish data were telling us uh, that there was a microcephaly cause here, um, when we looked at a marker of um, uh, bilateral symmetry of postmitotic neurons, uh, we had a clear phenotype. And when we look at the number of neurons being born, uh, we also had a very, very clear phenotype here. So there was clearly a defect in neurogenesis. Um, but this was, again, an N of 1. So there was always some concern. And the concern was really this. There is the valine, this little girl. And here is the rest of the animal kingdom. So as you can appreciate, we have almost everybody being methionine. In fact, valine is the derivative allele, is not the, the ancestral allele. So my statement to you is that if you have methionine in this particular gene, you essentially are haploid sufficient, and that is intolerant to sort of fecundity, essentially. This, this child has very severe neurological problems. Um, it's either that or, or there's a compensatory event. So what we did is we aligned all these sequences um, uh, and we identified a number of candidate residues uh, that seem to be traveling specifically with the methionine. And then we introduced these residues into the human sequence and we asked the question, can we rescue the allele? Um, and the answer is yes, we can. Um, we used the most direct phenotyping method, uh, which is the, 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 the most quantitative, which is the uh, counting the number of dots. Right? So each dot is a birth neuron, so we, we see here a reduction in neurogenesis and then a rescue and so forth, you get the idea. And the answer turns out to be that there's two alleles, R80K and L128V, and I, and I love showing this because it's like leucine to valine, oh yes, who gets out of bed for a leucine to valine change? Well, um, but it's true that if you actually change either of these positions, you essentially have full rescue or the functionality of the mRNA. And the other thing is that when you just consider these two alleles and nothing else in the context of evolution, we, you explain about 90% of the species for which this methionine allele can be tolerated. Now, I can also tell you, I'm, I, I don't have a result, but I can also tell you that uh, finally, about two weeks ago, we were contacted, we, we have this in Gene Matcher, of course, and we were contacted by a group who identified two de novo nonsense mutation in, 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 in two individuals, and we have also a phenotypic match, which sort of supports the, the, the causality, but that's another story. Okay. Why? This is the thing, right? It's a cool phenomenon, but why? So this is just predictions. Um, so what is this? Is, is This is um, thermodynamic mapping of the human protein based on crystal structure. So this is what your wild type looks like. Um, and then what happens is that when you actually model the valine to methionine at the far right, um, you actually get the tail of the molecule to flip out. It, it turns out, I don't have time to show you all the data, but it turns out that the tail has um, ubiquitination properties. Um, but, um, and then on the bottom, what I'm showing you is the human sequence in which we have now coded both the pathogenic mutation in the patient and each of the compensatory alleles. And I found it quite striking that just changing one amino acid residue, and remember, we have no real knowledge of why, we can actually restore um, the th uh, three-dimensionality of the tail, and that potentially explains why the double mutant is essentially functioning just like the wild type, but the single mutant is not. The reason of this big song and dance is because if you try to model this in the mouse, you would have been profoundly disappointed. 
but I think would be the, the, a really cool experiment, and I'll come to these, is when you humanize the entire locus. So I guess my message is, I'll, I'll be like one of my colleagues, I'll give you the punchline. Don't make missense mutations. Humanize the genes that you want to, to study and then introduce the human alleles into those individuals. Single base pair NICs with, with the CRISPR expedites a homologous recombination. You're dropping the entire locus. Come on, you're all experts at back recombinating. But making single base pair mutations based on CRISPR, you are uh, not a good idea. And let me tell you why really this is not a good idea, all right? So let me tell you a couple of examples. Now, uh, one area that I think as a community we need to do better uh, is report our negative data. Because sometimes our negative data are actually positive data that we don't know, right? So it has been incredibly difficult to track down individuals and examples who have made knockouts or knock-ins and they had an unexpected event, a.k.a. the mouse looked fine. I find that intensely interesting, provided that you can show that you actually did the knockout, you know, the technical stuff. But from the harvesting literature, there's, there's not many examples, but there's more, and I'm sure this group will generate tons more data about comparing knock-ins with knockouts. So for example, uh, you know, you have a, a recessive mutation, you take out the gene, this and that, but the performance is really poor. In fact, we're finding significant discordance in the penetrance and the expressivity of the phenotype of the knock-ins compared to the knockouts. Now, why is that? Of course, I'm going to argue that some of it has to do with this compensation, and I have a little bit of data to support that claim. So here's a gene that rolls off the, whose name rolls off the tongue. EIF2B5. I'm sure you all know it intimately. This locus is mutated in a severe disorder. This is a childhood ataxia with hypomyelination. Clearly will have a severe effect on fecundity. So it turned the mutation of the initial discovery mutation was this arginine 136 to histidine. And the human genetic data for this allele being pathogenic are actually quite compelling. Yeah, but here's the thing. The 136H histidine mouse, it's fine. Not a problem. So there is two potential. Now, Gary will tell me you didn't put in the right background, which it's possible. Um, but so my null hypothesis is that the cognate locus in the mouse contains a second allele that, you know, does its thing. So this is actually a testable hypothesis, and this is the test. So we know how to test cerebellar hypoplasia because when we knock out or knock down a gene in the, in, the, in, the cere uh, in, the, in the fish, we can actually flip the embryo in its back and we can actually measure the entire volume of the cerebellum. So we love these assays because they're quite quantitative. And here's the experiment. Each diamond is an individual uh, embryo and everything has been done in triplicate. So here's where we are. Um, we have our spread of wild type measurements. We have the suppression. Um, and then we have the performance of the wild type um, human and mouse mRNA. Here is the key result. In the human, R136H co uh, uh, um, uh, 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 attempt at rescue showed no rescue. If I take this allele and I put it in the murine sequence and I inject the fish with mouse cDNA, with mouse mRNA, it's R132H in the mouse sequence. That residue behaves as wild type, right? Which suggests that this residue is influenced by the only thing that is different between those two mRNAs is the rest of the cognate locus. Now, we have actually not found yet the, the compensated allele here. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complicated uh, because we have mm, close to 100 candidates. Um, so, but the fact remains that this experiment is good enough to predict, and this is what I'm hoping we can have a good conversation about. This very simple experiment is good enough to predict whether you should make a knock-in or whether you should make a replacement of the murine locus and then knock in the human allele you want to study, right? These are cheap experiments. These are, I mean, you know, um, th th these are not you know, this is not rocket science. We, we do this every day. Just to give you a sense, we've tested 2,500 alleles in 850 genes over about eight years. Mm. So, now, it, it also works the other way around. Let's go back to, there's this gene, uh, TDC21B, back to the ciliopathies. 
we and others reported many, many years ago this allele, P209L, is hypomorphic. And we have data on this guy from two sources. Source number one is human genetics. We know that a null TDC21B is incompatible with life. We know this for humans because uh, 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 fetuses with no alleles in TDC21B will have, you know, really horrible disorders like Michael Gruber syndrome and, and things like that. And most of them will perish prenatally. And also in the mouse, when we knock out TDC21B, uh, we get open neural tubes and, and most of the embryos perish by E15 to E16. P209L, uh, we reported a number of years ago in isolated nephronophysis uh, or syndromic versions of nephronophysis. Uh, likewise, when we expressed it in human cells and we measured the length of cilia, we actually showed that this allele was affecting the ciliary length. Um, and also, um, uh, we were al also be able to show that it was reasonably stable and all these things. Okay. So we, because we didn't know about the cis complementation stuff, we spent, you know, a little bit of time um, and we actually made a 209L knocking mouse because we needed to understand how a hypomorphic allele was behaving. And the problem is, uh, yeah, the hypomorphic mouse is not hypomorphic at all. In the mouse, in the strain that we chose, 209L is actually a no allele. We haven't formally done the experiment. To, there's, a, there's a mouse mutant called alien um, that is a true null. Um, and our animal, Phenocopis alien, now we haven't done the formal experiment to cross them and, and see what happens, but uh, if it's not a null, it's very, very severe. Um, we've been trying for the best part of a year. We've never seen a single 209L homozygote survive. So we asked the question, is this an, an inverse mechanism in which the 209L allele is milder, is protected in the human sequence, but is more severe in the mouse sequence? And it turns out to be exactly the case. These are our embryos. And in this particular case, again, we're looking at convergent extension because this is a cheap and dirty assay. And once again, we can actually see that the allele in the context of the mouse sequence is behaving as a no, whereas in the context of the human sequence, it is behaving as a hypomorph. I find that exciting. So we have, I don't have time to show you all the data. Um, I find that a little bit exciting because we've actually identified three candid compensatory alleles. And that is cool because these sites might also be candidates for um, genetic suppression of the phenotype in patients. And what is even more interesting here to consider is that we don't really know yet what the frequency of such events would be in the human population because the, the compensating alleles themselves are under absolutely no evolutionary pressure. They're just under genetic drift. Okay, last but not least. Everything I've shown you so far is dependent on evolutionary fitness. We're dealing with pediatric disorders, and the compensatory alleles always tend to come first. They tend to be older alleles, and they tend to be neutral or mildly pathogenic at worst. And then they essentially sensitize, they make the genome permissive for the really severe allele to land and nothing happens. And then you lose the compensatory allele, the severe allele becomes highly pathogenic, gets, gets a, a removed from the population until you get a human baby uh, who, who gets this allele and then suffers a severe disease. Yeah, that's not true. Um, I mean, it is true, but it's not the whole truth. Here is a disease that we can all agree has nothing to do with reproductive fitness. And the disease is Parkinson's disease. So alpha-synuclein. The mouse genome, the, the most, uh, uh, perhaps the most famous um, allele in alpha-synuclein is an I53T allele uh, that was actually discovered in a family from the Greek city of Patras, if I'm not mistaken. So the mouse genome encodes threonine. Uh, Alpha-syn is, is a small peptide. It's about 140, 150 amino acids. And for the longest time, the hypothesis was, oh, you know, the mouse is a terrible model for PD. Well, that hypothesis was defeated as early as 2003 when an A53T transgene by Lee et al. was actually shown to reproduce many of the fixtures of the disease, both at the level of pathology of the loss of dopaminergic neurons, uh, uh, as well as lethality and other things. So then the second idea was that maybe it's the level of expression. And it is true that alpha-synuclein is expressed at low levels in mouse compared to human. Yeah, but that's not true in that. It, it had to be the cat and the mouse, couldn't it now? But it is true 
that the cat genome also encodes A53T, and so does the opossum. And I'm sure we can all come up, or, 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 or the blind mole. I mean, these, I'm sure we can all come up with very interesting stories here. The point here is that we have a situation where the, the, the mouse, sure, lives two years, but the kitty cat lives 20 years. Um, so, and again, we have no evidence of Parkinsonism in cats. We're talking about the wild type strain, okay? And, you know, so, and this is an allele, a 53T, in case you're wondering, is I don't know if it's fixed in all cats, but in the cats that are the, 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 in the genome databases, they're all homozygous 53T. All right. So we looked at this. And it turns out, to give you sort of the reader's digest of this, that there's A53T here, and there's three other alleles that are un traveling uniquely with a cat genome and, 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 and the mole rat genome. And this is important. Um, it turns out that there is probably, I'm not going to go into the detail, but the, the, the prevailing hypothesis right now is that alpha-synuclein acts as a tetramer. And if you um, forbid its tetramerization, um, the monomer is actually toxic. And the microfibrils that are formed and all these things are in response to the cell to try to scoop up all the toxic protein, right? So it looks, it, and there's some interesting data that suggests that this region of the protein might actually be very important for promoting tetramerization. Now, all this, of course, is speculation. What is not speculation is what I'm about to show you. So the experiment that we did is we, the, the, the zebrafish genome does not have alpha-synuclein. However, if you express alpha-synuclein in zebrafish embryos and you measure dopaminergic neurons, also when you take out GBA, which is another gene that also causes Gaucher and also uh, predisposed to Parkinsonism, in, you, you need to load the system, you will actually start seeing quantitative loss of dopaminergic neurons. And the experiment that we did is um, we actually took a transgenic zebrafish embryo. Um, these are DAT positive neurons. And we developed a, uh, an algorithm where we can actually count the number of neurons, the midbrain and the brain. And we've controlled this with rotanone and you know, all these other things. I just want to sort of show the highlights here. And the highlights are fundamentally that the cat haplotype, when, when inserted in the context of the human sequence, right? So what we did is we've taken the genotype of the different species and we changed these positions uh, for human completely restores FT3T to wild type, indistinguishable. I do not know the biochemistry. We're, we're having fun doing you know, filter trap assays and, and, and things we, we're, we're, we're trying to learn how to do. But this is uh, striking because none of this is under evolutionary constraint. This is just a stochastic chance. And I actually think this is really important. For one, it would be really awesome to start taking human transgenes putting the mouse, reproducing the phenotype, and then start to, start to making these alleles in the context of the human sequence. In fact, um, we will be deeply motivated to participate in this part of the activity because we need to understand the, the, the effect of human variation. For the second thing, somebody mentioned um, uh, sort of non-Nikkei's uh, CRISPR editors and all these things. Well, these editors don't work for all residues at the moment. In fact, we only have two or three. I'm sure it'll get better, but in the meantime, by identifying these sites, we open up more opportunities for people to do gene editing for residues that cannot be edited. And I'll stop there. Um, this is, it has always been my stick for a long time. And finally, you know, um, you know uh, my old prof, Jim Lubsky, you say, you know, well, with that data, you're just another dude with an opinion. Well, here's some data. Uh, at first, the data was one gene, and then it became two, and now we are five for five. So we look for compensatory evidence, biological evidence, in five genes. I understand it's a small number, but this is no longer Tarzan stuff because it's reproducible. Um, and we found compensated alleles in each of these five genes. So we must really consider the concept. There is absolute evidence that some subset of alleles, and I don't know how many, maybe 10%, something like this, has a species-specific effect. It provides new info, opens absolute therapeutic options, and we must consider allele testing uh, before committing resources to make stable alleles. We have suffered out of this, and so has the community with false negatives. So this is it. And I'll, I'll stop there. I, I think I'm on time, give or take. Thank you. Thank you.